This is being Aaron. We are we are bringing you another episode of the Broken Oars podcast. We're not sure if it's a Broken Oars indoors or it's it's a Broken Oars, but we are going to be talking a little bit about how you can row with friends on the rowing machine, but on Lake Bled on the internet. But at the moment, we we are going to continue a conversation about. Rowing in the movies. Great rowing movies of our time. So I believe, Lewin, according to our Twitter feed, you might have been watching something that had rowing in it recently. Something about single sculling and no man being an island. If you're a single I, scu- <laughs> if you're a single sculler, don't we just treat you as an island? We just go round about I, go uh, round my you and I only watched the first 15 minutes of it. I've got to watch the rest of it because I literally do need to go through and work out where everything has gone wrong. And, you know, you you don't get that there. You don't get, you know, that's not like that. But it was a movie called, it was, it it gained its theatrical release. Do you remember, do you remember going to a movie theatre, Aaron? I I do. I I went to see Top Gun Maverick after all of the pandemic was over and I was finally allowed out of the house after multiple jabs. And I, I, I cried largely because I I hadn't realised how short Tom Cruise was before. Blew my mind. I, I I've always taken great happiness in how <laughs> short Tom Cruise. It makes up for the fact that he's massively, massively more wealthy than me. It's it's a bit like me and George Clooney. I, I can see the similarities between yourself and George Clooney. Yes. Fundamentally, George Clooney is a greater and more successful man than me in every single metric, right down to the fact that he has a very large house with staff on the shores of Lake Como. If you had that house, would your staff be a team of nutritionists, strength coaches and coaches? And basically you'd you'd start every day by taking a single out on Lake Como and pissing off the local Italians in their speedboats. I, I, I think there's a lot of rowing on Lake Como. Okay. I, I, I think they're very used to people pootling around in all-powered boats. Um, but, no, you see, the thing is, George Clooney, I, I gain enormous satisfaction from him. Um, I should say I love where I live, and I love living in Kent. I think Kent's great. Um, and I like living in my little village in kind of in the middle of nowhere. But... Um, I, I do feel some level of insecurity about George Clooney, particularly though now George Clooney has started advertising Nespresso and I drink Nespresso coffee in the morning. Mm. Every morning I know that George Clooney is drinking Nespresso and I'm drinking Nespresso. And fundamentally that means for Maybe five, ten minutes a day, my life is as good as George Clooney's. I have to say, as a man who has written a book called Charlotte Jackson and the Magic Blanket, who is therefore no stranger to fantastical (laughs) narratives and looking at the world in slightly left-field ways, that is a remarkable feat of imaginative engineering. You know, literally... In that in that ten minutes in the morning, maybe sometimes I'll stretch it out to fifteen if I'm staring at my phone. But in that ten minutes, with my cup of Nespresso in my hand, um, we're not. I should point out we're not actually paid by Nespresso to say this. This is one of the many kind of like advertising things that we've done that we're not being paid for, which is shocking. But with my cup of Nespresso in my hand. I am literally there in the mansion next to George Clooney. And I'm just like, all right, George, how you doing? You and me drinking Nespresso together for 10 minutes a day. And and it costs me, I, I don't, and here's the brilliant thing. I don't even buy Nespresso capsules. I buy Starbucks capsules. So Nespresso isn't getting any richer off me, which means George Clooney isn't getting any richer off me. But for 15 minutes a day, my life is as good as George Clooney's. 
Okay. Um, I'm not sure whether to call an ambulance or ring your, your wonderful wife and ask for some kind of intervention to be arranged, but do you know the, the Buddhist or the, or the Taoist aphorism, last night I dreamt I was a butterfly, today does the butterfly dream that he is a man? Does that mean that when you are being George Clooney, is there a moment in time when George Clooney is being Dr. Lewin Hines with a fantastic 2K score? I don't think you'd ever get that lucky. Bad <laughs> <laughs> right moment, Tish. We're here all week. Try the deal. Oh yes, but it's anyway, a vegetarian option. Yeah, um, so, so you, no, you're movies rowing in yeah. the movies, rowing in the movies, notoriously handled incredibly badly. Incredibly badly. Um, Meryl Streep, notable exception. Um. Yeah. She's I, she's I, pure I, method. I I heard she trained with Leander for eighteen months for the role. You what know, you I about? I remember watching Meryl Streep in a single skull. Right. Um. It was a movie. I don't remember what the movie is. Uh. Had Kevin Bacon in it. Um. It was about uh psychopathic bank robbers. Uh. Who sounds like single scholars? Yes. Yeah. Who. Uh, we're using Meryl Streep's white water rafting experience to escape down a river somewhere, possibly in the Appalachian Mountains, but to get away from the bad guys. And at some point, they transferred the loot into a single and said, quick, row as fast as you can. It's the No, it, it, it was the thing. She just used the single skull to keep fit in between white water rafting because you, you do that white water rafting thing where you sit quite high up. Yeah, on the raft, and you do arms only, right stuff, and it's all quite dangerous. But um, it's pretty much what all single scholars do. They never use their legs. They basically just tap along with arms. That's it. Yeah. I mean, they're they're not really proper rowers. We don't but, include them in this podcast. Yeah, the the opening shot was Meryl Streep sculling along a very polite river somewhere, probably in Boston, um, and making a very decent fist of single sky. Okay, okay. Well, I'm going to throw an entry into the into the ring. So, and I'm going to give props to Stephen Graham from Tyne United who who said you must watch this. It will it will change your mind about rowing. And and it has I, I it's changed my mind to the fact that that rowing movies never are never historically accurate. So, there is a rowing movie out there called um The Boy in Blue which if you type into your search engine at work could lead to disciplinary measures. So don't do it at work. Um, It stars Nicolas Cage, well-known method actor and all round scene stealer in the sense that if there's scenery there, he will try and eat it. And it's about a scholar that I hadn't heard of called Ned Hanlon, who was a Canadian and who went on to be a world champion scholar and run for public office and was elected by a landslide and all of the rest of it. And it's basically, it's a Rocky movie on the water without any of the charm of Sylvester Stallone attempting words with more than one syllable in them. But it turns out Nicolas Cage in the movie does his own sculling and some of it is pretty bad, but some of it in a wooden shell with a sliding seat and old fashioned oars is actually pretty good. There you go. That's it. I was, you know, the the movie itself was complete and utter tosh. There were, there were, there were fixes and there were fights and there was womanizing and there was there was betting on the outcomes of races. And apparently, an American invented the sliding seat, even though we all know that it was Harry Clasper for the love of all that's holy, as well as, you know, the outboard rigor and, and everything that we now take to do with fine rowing. Um, there was none of the charm of the Rocky movies, but he does his own sculling. And, and the thing is, I think he got deeply invested in the role because you can tell he was thinking like a male single sculler. Because at every single possible opportunity, when there were, were women about, he took his clothes off. Yeah, that, that, that's almost de rigueur. That That's how you spot someone who's a natural single scholar. He got deep um, into the role. He was he was always semi-naked when there were females on the banks watching him. Any so, time between essentially the end of February and the beginning of November. Pretty much. And he, Lycra he, rolled down to your waist. 
Yeah, he did look buff, but yeah, he did his he did his own sculling and made a decent fist of it. So so I don't know if we can watch the other the the one that we talked about a while ago, Heart of a Champion. I should be the that, 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 that. that's the one I was watching. But the, is that the one you watching? Yeah, when it's um, they changed its name. They called it Pressure Point when it when it rocked up on Amazon. Like, right. Um, and it's terrible. I mean, it's genuinely terrible. You can see, I've only watched the first, like, 20 minutes of it. Um, but first of all, it, you can see that somebody who's been involved in rowing was there and to tell them that, okay, so the guys, when they've got their blue screen rowing thing, I don't quite know how they did it. I think right. they must have set up a blue screen in a tank and they're, okay. and they're, and they're doing their rowing, but there's kind of like, there's all this looking out of the boat. There's looking around in an eight. Um, there's, there's, there's calls coming in from four and four trying to lead the boat. This is, this is where you get the infamous because four is a tall, good looking, arrogant, Aryan blonde type sounds with a like massive four. ergo score. Definitely sounds therefore, like four. Therefore thinks that he should be in charge of everything. Isn't this the movie where someone says, uh, of course I should be in the boat. I have the biggest erg score, which is the, 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 when you, the sign of any coach, when any coach hears that, they go, you're going nowhere near my boat, Bonnie lad or lass. No, no, no. The, the, the quote is, the quote is, why should you be the boat captain? Because I've got the biggest, not ergo, rowing machine score. Rowing machines measure fitness, son. They don't measure leadership. Yeah. To which I replied, yes, they bloody do. <laughs> well, that's where you and I fundamentally, you know, differentiate and 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 part. You know, yes, they can. It's just that it's possibly because I don't have a massive a massive oak score anymore. If I had a, if I had a massive oak score, I'd be walking around the boathouse with a t shirt with it printed on, going, "Yes, that is my score. I am a man amongst men." However, I I, I, I have earned my right to rule. Um, yeah, I, I am I, I'm I, entitled. I have to play. I have to play what I like to refer to as the weasel card. Which which I used to abhor in rows. Which well, I should be in your book because I I have superb technique and rhythm I, and, and rhythm. I, I used to hate people who did that because it's like, well, you're only saying that because your two K score is crap, and now I have to use it because I'm old and knackered. Um, yes. Yeah, so the boy, the boy in blue. I recommend that everybody involved in rowing watches it, possibly on an Easter Monday, possibly when it's raining, possibly when there's nothing else on. It's an Easter Monday of a movie, but fair play to Nick Cage, apparently, and he, it certainly looked like it, he does his own schooling in the movie, in a wooden shell with old-fashioned wooden blades, and he makes a decent fist of it. I'm going to recommend everybody watch Pressure Point Stroke Heart of a Champion. Um, simply because you get, I think you get a very good idea of what people who don't row think rowing is like. Which um, leads on, that leads on to the next question, though. If people who make movies think rowing is like one thing rather than what we know it is like, why can't we have a great rowing movie in the way that we've had some amazing climbing movies like Alex Alex Honnold's Free Solo and things like that? Because because rowing is is a similar internal and external journey, whether it's single sculling or crew rowing. There there is there is dramatic material there. I mean, you just have to. The reason why Gold Fever worked wasn't because of the rowing; it was because of the clashes of the personalities involved and the, their trials and tribulations are, 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 are along the way. Do you think it's right for sports movie them? Um, I, I think that is. I think that fundamentally, so if you look at Alex Honnold's free solo, mm. he's climbing up a very, very, very tall cliff. Yes. And ev literally everybody knows what's going to happen if it goes wrong. Yeah, he's going he's gonna to go splat after about yeah. four seconds. 
Yeah, it, it, it and you know that it, it, and if it's caught on camera, I mean that's going to be like, oh my, oh my word. Um, apparently, he stopped doing it. He, he he stopped doing free soloing. Well, that looking at what happened to Alex Bacar and in, in who was a free soloist in the seventies and eighties in Yosemite, he, eventually your foot does slip or or your fingers slip or the piece of or, or or something happens. Eventually, you come off. It happens to all climbers, whether yeah. they're Johnny Dawes, Alex Honnold, or, or you and I, you know. Yeah, but yeah, he. I think I think he had a. I think he had a near moment. Right. Um. And and he stopped doing this, or his girlfriend said that she'd leave him, or something, which is not entirely unreasonable because, like you said, sooner or later it's going to go wrong. Yeah. Um. But I think that for people who don't row, mm. it's very very difficult to explain just how close to an absolutely catastrophic, I mean, obviously not fatal, but humiliating catastrophic outcome, you are in a race. Just, you know, it is that, again, it's like drive to survive, the Formula One thing on Netflix, which is brilliant. Everybody understands what's going to happen. Everybody's seen the footage of a Formula One car spinning off the track, going into a tire wall and essentially eggshelling itself. Mm. Um, People understand that. You don't understand, I think, unless you've actually done it, the utter terrifying fear of making a boat move fast and the fact that it's just a completely unstable it's like running along a tightrope and it's very difficult to explain this idea of having a race carrying a heavy weight or running along a tightrope but even when you're very very good at it your job is to push yourself into this like kind of tiny edge of the envelope area where you're so uncomfortable with how quickly and how hard you're doing it that it's scary, but you're not so uncomfortable that you're actually slowing down. And I think that's a really, really difficult thing to explain to someone who's never done that. You know, I, I don't know what it's like to be an Olympic rower. I don't know what it's like to be a Oxford blue and be getting steered by a certifiable lunatic short Australian girl who's going to cut up Leander, although I imagine it's probably brilliant. But I do know what it's like to be a novice rower with a genuine chance of winning your first pot at Peterborough and just the sheer fear of this going horribly wrong and getting smacked in your, the face by your own oar about 750 metres down the track because you're just absolutely attempting to rip the riggers off every single stroke because if you don't, those bastards from Cantabs are going to catch up with you and so you just can't slow down it's literally this thing if it feels comfortable you're not going fast enough I think that's I think that's an important point because I mean obviously the people who listen to us our dear listener thank you for you know clicking um download multiple times and making us look like we've got an audience um we're talking to rowers and rowing people and people involved in rowing and with the familiarity of being in a boat you actually forget how difficult it is to sit a boat and move a boat i think there's a perception i certainly had it before i started rowing when i when i watched you know red brave's last stand the boats looked like they were sat in concrete in terms of you know the shell was stable the shell was level and it just looked like they were hooning massive amounts of power and zipping down the track and it looked like fun it wasn't until i got in a boat i realized how hard it was to sit it 
how hard it was to keep it level, what, you know, all of the, the minutiae that goes into actually making a boat move that you have to learn painfully, which we talked about in our episode with, with Pete, that you just have to learn by doing it. Um, and, 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 then, and, and that's just in like the first 500 meters, yeah. not the last 500 meters, when you're literally, you've got so little oxygen left in your bloodstream that if like a doctor saw you, they panic and think you were dying of asphyxiation. And yeah, and that's the thing, because if you, okay, if you take a men's heavyweight eight, it weighs the best part of a ton. And you're going yep. to move that at, at, at plus five meters per second down the track at 38 strokes a minute. And it's a huge amount of weight, which is why Trenton Oldfield jumping into the water between the Oxford and Cambridge boats many years ago was the act of a complete and utter idiot it's it, it weighs a huge amount there's a lot of moving parts if you get it wrong you are going to permanently damage the back of the person in front of you if you get it wrong you could lose your teeth if you get it wrong bad things can happen it's a that's why rowing eights and rowing fours and rowing quads and, and moving boats fast well is such a joyous and exhilarating experience because there is actually still an element of danger to it and when you do it well there's an element of knowing you've mastered a very very difficult skill and that's hard to translate to someone who watches it and goes well it looks easy they just they, they just kind of put the oar in and 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 pull and and the boat kind of does the rest because it's not actually like that so that's that's hard to translate and it might and i'm going to sidebar here the difficulty in representing rowing and the difficulty of rowing in movies and why it's so rewarding when you can do it well, that's maybe why we don't have very many outstanding books about rowing. And when we do have good books about rowing, the only reason, the only way they can explain rowing to the non rower is to talk in terms of analogies. It's like, it feels like, and they, and you get into the realms of, spirituality and physicality rather than the actual the the there is no other feeling of moving a boat well other than the feeling of moving a boat well no, do you know what really I mean? isn't no you you yeah i mean i i like to say back back in the day when i was like getting out in a single skull maybe four times a week mm. and i was actually like an opponent to be noted as opposed to this guy who used to be quite good. Um, my, the most notable thing about when I was sculling well was it was a little bit like flying very low to the water. Hmm. You felt a little bit like a bird lazily flapping over the water like a large pelican or something. Hmm. Um, but again, it's still not quite like that. The only understandable kind of equivalent of moving a boat well is hmm. moving a boat well. And hmm. it, it, it it's not a, yeah, it's, it's not an intuitive thing. It's very, very difficult to explain and to empathize with unless you've actually done it. It is. And and the other reason why, you know, another reason why there are not a huge amount of outstanding books about rowing and everyone's now going to flood the Twitter feed and go, yes, but what about, and what about, and what about? I think that I'm throwing this open, open to debate. I think that the Tim Foster four men in a boat book tells us more about the dynamics of the four running up to the Sydney Olympics than Redgrave's book and Pinson's book ever did. And I think the reason is because Redgrave and Pinson, I think Pinson is, Matt is obviously a very, very intelligent individual, but as elite athletes, there is a certain level of introspection that's required for growth, but he's not really going to get into the mechanics of how the boat feels and what they've done to get to that point where they are elite performers, because it's very, if you're there, you're there. And it's very matter of fact, it's what you do every day. 
So they're not going to translate the experience to the layman because it's an untranslatable experience. Foster comes closer because he talks about the personalities and the conflicts and the dynamics and the and and the quirky stuff that happens behind the scenes. So you get more of a sense that you can then translate to your own rowing club experience. You know, we we all have a Redgrave type in our club, someone who is surly, always has his own corner in the changing room. If anyone puts their their bag there by accident, they get growled at. They have their own spot on the settee in the clubhouse. Um, we all have a, you know, a, a, a foster, a talented maverick who is prone to acts of career-ending stupidity. Um, we all have those dynamics. But I, I would like to point out none of us have a cracknel because there's only one ever made. Thank God. They broke the mould when they made him because it was the right thing to do. There should only ever be one of him at any given time because one is, frankly, more than enough. So, and I know there are books out there, there's stuff about, you know, Zen and the art of rowing, like Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance, and there's the journey of a single scholar and all of this kind of stuff. But in a lot of cases, they are talking about their lives and their circumstances as much as they're talking about rowing and why rowing became a meditative um outlet for them in the same way that that Archie and Ethan talked about you know rowing as students rowing becomes a, a break from the grind of being a student and I know that every young person every old person is now going to go this no wait till you get a mortgage and a job that's when you know what grind is but Archie talked about rowing being a cleanse where he could leave everything out but that's why there's no great movies and no great books about rowing because it's a fundamentally untranslatable experience to those who don't do it I think that's true um, and I, I think it's also the other thing is that you will notice just like the massive difference in opinion about a movie with rowing in it. Mm. Rowers love the social network because for a very, very brief moment in time, it's like maybe for a whole, you know, 90 seconds of screen time, there was rowing portrayed really very well in it. Yes. Um, but, you know, and, and if you get rowers and the conversation goes on to the movie, The Social Network, that's what they'll talk about it. They won't talk about actually what is like, did it win an Oscar? I think it might have won an Oscar. I think it won an Oscar. I think Aaron Aaron Sorkin did, you know, yeah, the screenplay. screenplay or something like that. Yeah. Um, and also, it won, and also, but you won't talk about the screenplay. No. You won't talk about um, Jesse Watts-his-face's epic performance of um, Mark Zuckerberg. Even, and, he, I have no idea whether it's like Mark Zuckerberg or not. I, I don't really follow Mark Zuckerberg at all. I imagine he's a very important individual. I should follow him. But, you know, what we'll talk about is that, oh, yeah, the, the social network, great bit of rowing in that one. Yeah, we won't talk about the fact that it, it invented, it's about the invention of something that fundamentally changed our world, our society, our communities, and how we interact with one with one another. We'll talk about the fact that for once, Hollywood ed- executives don't go, Gr- okay, so we're going to Henley Shire, and there's going to be a big race, and at the end of the race... There'll be there'll be a fight and they'll they'll lose an all, but someone will swim out with a with a rigger jigger and they'll they'll refix the rigger and they'll 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 come through to win on the line because that just doesn't happen. It does actually happen in the boy in blue. Someone swims out to him with a, a rigger and he ends to with a rigger jigger to fix the rigger that's been scuppered by the baddies and he ends up winning the race despite having been sat on the water for a minute and a half while waiting for someone to swim out to him with a rigger jigger. This is not necessarily historically accurate, but Nick Cage does do his own schooling, so fair play to him. On the subject of talented practitioners and and how their experience is untranslatable to the layman, the Mark Hancock returned to rowing last weekend. Oh, oh, the, the mighty Hancock. The mighty Hancock. And if you listen to us regularly, dear listener, all one of you, um, you'll know we've talked about Mark Hancock in glowing terms. And Pete Holmes is on record as saying he is he is the most talented rower he ever rowed with. And Luna and I both kind of went, okay, any minute now he's <laughs> going to say something nice about us. And he no. did. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was one of those, like, you know, um, the, the apocryphal story of... Um, uh, Jürgen going down 
the line um, with uh, the Sydney Four, and it's like, ah, Matthew, you, you are, you are the most powerful stroke man in in the race. You will surely win. Ah, Steve, Steve, you have so much experience. You know how to win. You will surely win. Ah, James, James, you are the most determined drawer I have ever rode with. You will surely win. Ah. Tim, you have lovely hair. <laughs> it, yeah. it was kind of one of those. It's just like, just anything. I'll, I'll take, I have lovely hair. You know, uh, yeah. I, I had a really strong catch. Yeah. Anything, um, please, Pete. <laughs> not a damn thing. Hancock got, he was, he's the most talented rower I ever worked with. We got, you were part of the fittest squad that, that I'd ever coached. That was it. Han, <laughs> Hancock talent, us muscles and, you know, Anyway, yes, Mark was up. Um, Mark is a superbly talented rower. He's one of those individuals who can. And there are a lot of people who claim to be, able, oh, I can row on either side of the boat. Well, most people can't. Most people have a preferred side. Most people have a side they've spent the most time on that they're most comfortable with. Mark was one of those individuals who could flawlessly row on either side of the boat. He could be a perfect stroke man. He could be a perfect bow man. If you put him at three, the ejector seat, he would be a perfect three. If you put him at six, it'd be a perfect six. He was just, he was just a great, a great rower. And he's one of those horrible individuals who's insanely good at everything. He's a talented musician who plays bass and brass instruments and now guitar. And he's, I believe he's also moving into piano. He takes amazing photographs. Uh, he designs world championship Formula One winning engines. Um, for fun. Where, where did he go to university? He went to Cambridge. Yeah, I hate him. Yeah, he went to Cambridge. Um, for fun, in our off-season at Agecroft, he and his brother would cycle around the Tour de France route for fun, just to kind of keep a nick while he was waiting for the rowing season to start again. And what makes it worse is he's one of those horrible people who don't tell you about how amazing he is all the time. He's the nicest, most self-effacing um kindest gentlest person you could want until you get him in a boat and then he turns into an absolute monster so mark came out with us on saturday he was up visiting his parents he asked if he could pop down to the rowing club tiny united very kindly um slotted him in he went at three in the quad that i, that I was in he banged out 14 and a half k like it was only yesterday since he was at henley rattled through the pieces and Dan was the, he was the only person that Dan didn't rip apart in the boat. Aaron, da 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 Paul, da 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 Mark, you're fine. Ah, for the love of God. Yeah, just, just, roaring coaches, they're, they're, they're just, they're all psychopaths. I'm beginning to, yeah, I'm beginning to think that that could well be the case. They are, they are driven men, and and the people who are driving them to insanity are usually the rowers that they work with. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, Mark, it, 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 it's a point like this that it's like when you know the the call go, goes up, and it's like, oh, they're driven men, and sort of like there are lots of just like women out there who, and they say, well, why are more of them women? It's just like because you're nice people and you don't want to be a rowing coach. Pretty much, yeah. I think there's got to be a certain element of 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 of. Ah! And lay, oh, which brings me on to the second point. Why why do boats with women in them? When you row with women, why do they? Or why do they just go better than the boats with men in them? Um, I I, I genuinely don't like to talk about this because if you <laughs> if you look at the difference between men and women on the ergo, mm. it's about a minute. If you look at the difference between men and women on the water, it's mm. about 45 seconds. Yeah. And that basically means they're better than us. In every way. Um, yeah, we're going to cut that bit. Anyway, moving swiftly on. No, 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 um, seriously, this is an important point. So went out with Mark, had a great outing. Had a, you know, did some paddling, did, did did some drills. Mark was back in the boat. All was well with my world. Great outing. Really good outing. Really positive. Did some pieces, uh, did some wind-ups. Mark's only comment was, we can go much faster than 34. We're not trying. It's like, for God's sake, we're old. Um, went out with James, 
Catherine, Jill, and myself, flawless. Flawless from the moment we pushed off the landing stage. We did we did pause rowing all the way up the slide. The boat was just like set. It was running for miles between each stroke. What is it? What is the magic? What is the secret? Why is is it because ladies don't get hung up on ego and biceps and macho testosterone and just kind of do what makes the boat go faster and well? Um, I'm. <sighs> I don't know, but I, I have noticed exactly what you're talking about in that women do seem to be able... Okay, right. Fundamentally, women don't necessarily make the boat move faster because there is this, like, there's this fundamental kind of, like, 33% watts difference between men and women and like bloody, bloody, blah, 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 physiology, red blood cell count, mm. heart size, etc. Is there something ineffable that I've noticed every time I've rode with women that they seem better at not slowing the boat down than my male crewmates for the most part? And the answer would be Yes, I think so. Yeah. And I don't know what it is. I don't know if it is some purely kind of like bizarre physiological or physiognomic thing that kind of they have I'm just, they have narrower shoulders, therefore they have better control of where the blades are or they're better at translating controlling the momentum of their bodies at the catch or so i don't know i literally don't know but i have this sneaking and agonizing suspicion that on average 50 percent of the population are better at rowing than the other 50 percent and we kind of know which way around that goes if you're sort of like, if you're normalizing for like grunt. Yes. I think that based on my experiences in our, in our, in our little composite quad at Tyne United, and I'm going to wildly generalize because it's what I do, what I do best. I think ladies are, I think men are better at talking about what needs to be done and ladies tend to do it. To be honest, I was I was making the calls in a in our little compo quad, and usually if I'm in a boat and I go right, we need to hold the slide because you're all piling into my kidneys, and I've only got twenty percent of them left, so please stop it. Nothing happens. But if I was saying right, we're going to hold the finish and we're going to focus on moving from the back of the seat to the front on our rock over and letting the boat take us forward, the change would happen like that. It was it was stark how responsive they were to me being you know a, a volleyball gobshite in a boat and and do you find that do you find that that automatically then leads to better response from the men in the boat james was in front of me on this occasion and james uh hello james if you're listening is a, a fantastic rower and i love rowing with him and he was actually in he was in, in the boat steering with mark and he was another one that dan went da -da 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 -da. mark you're fine um i don't know maybe it's a it's a case of soothing the savage beast there are ladies around so we will behave properly you know we we will listen to calls and behave prop we, we will be genteel we will have drawing room manners in our boat yeah i mean rah, 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 rah. You know, because my experience of mixed eight has been that that it's like kind of hang on, it's like the guy we're you know I'm I'm being more polite and more sensible and not just like how long shall I row longer? How hard shall I push harder? It yeah. was just like no, let's 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 work with the boat and yeah, I don't know. Um, interesting phenomenon. Um, yeah. I'm sure I'm sure there is a lot of psychology in there and and stuff it was my first double session for a while and i slept for the first time since agecroft i i had a little a little granddad nap in in the afternoon when i came back i didn't actually mean to i just sat down with a cup of coffee and woke up 90 minutes later 
<laughs> um, which was nice. And and then everything hurt for three days, like really, okay. really hurt. Um, the last comment on Mark. So Mark came down. Everyone at Tyne was very welcoming, so I'd like to thank them for that. Mark was his usual, wonderful, polite, self-effacing, boat-moving genius self. And at the end of it, our club captain went, so Mark, did you enjoy your outing? Oh, yeah, it was great. Nice to be back in the boat. Haven't been in a quad since 2016. And I'm like, and he's still better than all of us. Mother of God. And our club captain went, so um, how often do you visit your parents? Are there any regattas that you feel like you'd like to do? And I'm like, oh, for God's sake, just tap him up. Why don't you? Yeah, no, no, it's entirely reasonable. That 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 is what should happen. Constant recruiting. Constant um, recruiting. So, Aaron. Yes. We've also had a special experience together, rowing together. For we? the first time in a while, Lune and I have not only trained together, we have rowed together. And, and then we rowed together now, in a very, very special location, didn't we? We we went, dear listener, to Lake Bled. We did. We went, we went there, so you didn't have to. Uh, yeah, we we. Did we also go to Boston. We went to Boston. We did, and, and we did Boston's infamous sewer loop, which is what happens if your cox takes a wrong turn during the head of the Charles. Um, and it should be pointed out. I think the last time we trained together was when we went climbing about eight or nine years ago, something like that. And uh, the last time we yes, rode, yeah, um, eight years ago. And the last time we rode together was at Agecroft. 12 years ago or uh, was it not ahead of the river was it uh, not the infamous head of the river washing well, we, it down sideways we did head of the river the last time we raced together was head of the river the last time we trained together would have been in the lead up to that henley and when you were in the process of moving down south again yeah so it would have been a good a good 11 years ago easily 11 yes. or 12 years ago 12 i'd say, I'd, I'd say 12 yeah. So 2009. And we've actually got we've actually got out on the water and actually done some work on the earth together. Would you like and to reveal how we've done it? We did. We did it through the magic of computers, Aaron. We joined the modern world. We did. And um so yes, dear listener, it, this comes back to um my unfortunate obsession with the rowing machine. Um, as they call it in Heart of Champions, um, not the Ergo. Um, but, yeah, we we hooked our rowing machines up to our computers. We hooked our computers up to the internet and downloaded a program called EXR, mm-hmm. um, which allowed us to simulate our rowing on the rowing machine as a single skull going around one or two famous rowing courses around the world. Um, And in a stroke of genius, it wasn't simply that what was on the rowing screen translated into how fast our boat was moving. They actually said, how much do you weigh? Right. We're going to, we're going to do some mathematical magic and we're going to slow your rowing boat down accordingly. Mm. And they did. So um, they wait adjust. Was, sorry, it, they wait adjust. Automatically weight, weight adjusted. So um, me and Aaron could skull round Lake Bled together, um, despite a slight difference in our natural kind of like rate eighteen scores. Mm. And uh, it was all rather sort of fun and games. I thought. It was it was it was great fun. I'm not sure how much I enjoyed being a 70 kilo lightweight. Uh, I can see why they why they go mad, and it's not just staring at a lettuce leaf for eight hours a day. Um, it was an interesting experience. It was really great fun to row with Lewin again, definitely, because we used to basically sit next to each other on a rowing machine for most of our lives at Agecroft. Um, you know, Ben on one side. Pete Holmes said we were very fit. Yeah, Ben on one side, me in the middle, Loon on the other side. I was essentially a mobile buffer state in between Loon and Ben, who struck sparks off each other. I was I was Belgium to their France and Germany, uh, uh, circa nineteen thirteen, uh, which was a wonderful place to be. And then, if 
Justin came into into the mix, then I suddenly I basically got tanks rolling. I mean, yeah, J- Justin was like Gabriela Princhet, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he was just one way or another. The man was going to start a war. He was going to start a conflict. Yes, I I I remember. I actually remember one conversation between him and Ben that 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 went. From Ben. Well, I'm a science teacher. I know what I'm talking about. And Justin going, well, I'm a doctor, so I definitely know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and I went, and I'm leaving now because this is going to end in fisticuffs. Um, but all good fun. Yeah, it was really interesting. The I've not really tried any of the Virtue Row or the, um, the Peloton, Peloton Rower or any of the other things that are kind of heading in this direction. When we talked to Mark Davis, he talked about the squad having... A, a, a simulation program so they could practice on ergs. They could visualize going down the track because it was there on big screens in front of them. I thought this was an interesting addition to the canon. And I'm going to say before I tried this, when Lewin said, you know, log in, get the free trial, let's give it a go. I was like, no, no, it's not right. I just want to see numbers on a screen. I know numbers on a screen. I want to see them going up or coming down. I, I, I know what it looks like on a PM5 monitor. This is, this is wrong. And I did a little warm up while I was waiting for him to log on. And I was like, no, don't like it. Don't like it at all. This person can't skull for a start, which meant it was actually my avatar was pretty accurate with my own self. Um, but I have to say that as we did it, I really started getting into it. Um, yeah, no, I. So what we're talking about, there is also the so the hollow fit um the which is kind of a a similar sort of thing where you can do rowing and just see yourself um yeah sculling through fantasy environments but you're going forwards which is kind of strange Mm. um but no i i'm currently finding it very enjoyable um it has some slight disadvantages 